Nationalism in India Introduction Children, in the previous class, we have discussed about the making of a global world. Today, in this chapter, we are going to know about the nationalism in India. As you have seen, modern nationalism in Europe came to be associated with the formation of nation-states. It also meant a change in people's understanding of who they were and what defined their identity and sense of belonging. In most countries, the making of this new national identity was a long process. How did this consciousness emerge in India? Objectives Now we are discussing about the topic of the First World War, Khilafat and Non-Cooperation, differing strands within the moment, towards civil disobedience, the limits of civil disobedience, the sense of collective belonging. Modern nationalism in Europe came to be associated with the formation of nation-states. It also meant a change in people's understanding of who they were and what defined their identity and sense of belonging. In India, as in Vietnam and many other colonies, the growth of modern nationalism is intimately connected to the anti-colonial movement. People began discovering their unity in the process of their struggle with colonialism. The Congress under Mahatma Gandhi tried to forge these groups together within one moment. But the unity did not emerge without conflict. The story from the 1920s and study the non-cooperation and civil disobedience movements. The First World War, Khilafat and non-cooperation in the years after 1919, we see the national movement spreading to new areas, incorporating new social groups and developing new modes of struggle. First of all, the war created a new economic and political situation. It led to a huge increase in defense expenditure, which was financed by war loans and increasing taxes. Custom duties were raised and income tax introduced. The war years prices increased, doubling between 1913 and 1918, leading to extreme hardship for the common people. Villages were called upon to supply soldiers, and the forced recruitment in rural areas caused widespread anger. The idea of Satyagraha Mahatma Gandhi returned to India in January 1915, which he called Satyagraha. The idea of Satyagraha emphasized the power of truth and the need to search for truth. It suggested that if the cause was true, if the struggle was against injustice, then physical force was not necessary to fight the obsessor. Without seeking vengeance or being aggressive, a satyagrahi could win the battle through non-violence. By this struggle, truth was bound to ultimately tramp. Mahatma Gandhi believed that this dharma of non-violence could unite all Indians. In 1916, he travelled to Champaran in Bihar to inspire the peasants to struggle against the oppressive plantation system. In 1918, Mahatma Gandhi went to Ahmedabad to organize a Satyagraha movement amongst cotton mill workers. The Rolith Act emboldened with this success. Gandhiji, in 1919, decided to launch a nationwide Satyagraha against the proposed Rolith Act 1919. This act 
had been hurriedly passed through the Imperial Legislative Council, despite the united opposition of the Indian members. Mahatma Gandhi wanted non-violent civil disobedience against such unjust laws which would start with the Hartel on 6th April. On 13th April, the infamous Jallianwala Bagh incident took place. On that day, a large crowd gathered in the enclosed ground of Jallianwala Bagh. The news of Jallianwala Bagh spread. Crowds took to the streets in many North Indian towns. There were strikes, clashes with the police and attacks on government buildings. Mahatma Gandhi now felt the need to launch a more broad-based movement in India. But he was certain that no such movement could be organized without bringing the Hindus and Muslims closer together. The First World War had ended with the defeat of Ottoman Turkey and there were rumours that a harsh peace treaty was going to be imposed on the Ottoman Emperor. The spiritual head of the Islamic world, the Khalifa. In March 1919, the Ali brothers, Muhammad Ali and Shaukat Ali, formed a Khalafat committee in Bombay to governor support for the Turkish Khalafat. Mahatma Gandhi realized that Khilafat would be the most favorable step to invite Muslims and Hindus for the common cause of a national movement. Therefore, he launched non-cooperation movement in support of Khilafat. Why non-cooperation? Hindu Swaraj 1909 is a momentous work of the Gandhian ideology. In this book, Mahatma Gandhi throws light the ideas of non-cooperation and self-rule for the first time. Mahatma Gandhi, in his book Hind Swaraj, suggested that if Indians resolved not to cooperate, the British rule would get abolished. The fall of the British rule will pave the way for Swaraj of self-governance. Then, in case the government used repression, a full civil disobedience campaign would be launched. Through the summer of 1920, Mahatma Gandhi and Shaukat Ali toured extensively mobilizing popular support for the movement. The movement in the towns The movement started with middle-class participation in the cities. Thousands of students left government-controlled schools and colleges. Headmasters and teachers resigned and lawyers gave up their legal practices. The efforts of non-cooperation on the economic front were more dramatic. Foreign goods were boycotted, liquor shops picketed and foreign cloth burned in huge bonfires. The import of foreign cloth halved between 1921 and 1922, its value dropping from Rs. 102 crore to Rs. 57 crore. Rebellion in the countryside From the cities, the non-cooperation movement spread to the countryside. It drew into its fold the struggles of peasants and tribals which were developing in different parts of India in the years after the war. In Avad, peasants were led by Baba Ramachandra, a sannyasi who had earlier been to Fiji as an indentured labourer. The movement here was against talukdars and landlords who demanded from peasants exorbitantly high rents and a variety of other cases. The movement here was against Talukdars and landlords demanded from peasants exorbitantly high rents and a variety of other cases. Peasants had to do beggar and 
work at landlords' farms without any payment. The peasant movement demanded reduction of revenue, abolition of bigger and social boycott of oppressive landlords. In many places, Naidhobi buns were organized by panchayats to deprive landlords of the services of even barbers and washermen. In the Gudam hills of Andhra Pradesh, for instance, a militant guerrilla movement spread in the early 1920s, not a form of struggle that the Congress could approve. Alluri Sita Ram Raju claimed that he had a variety of special powers. He could make correct astrological predictions and heal people, and he could survive even bullet shots. Captivated by Raju, the rebels proclaimed that he was an incarnation of God. Raju talked of the greatness of Mahatma Gandhi, said he was inspired by the non-cooperation movement, and persuaded people to wear khadi and give up drinking. Towards Civil Disobedience In February 1922, Mahatma Gandhi decided to withdraw the non-cooperation movement. He felt the movement was turning violent in many places and satyagrahis needed to be properly trained before they would be ready for mass struggle. Within the Congress, some leaders were by now tired of mass struggles and wanted to participate in elections to the provincial councils they had been set up by the Government of India Act of 1919. When the Simon Commission arrived in India in 1928, it was greeted with the slogan, Go Back Simon. All parties, including the Congress and the Muslim League, participated in the demonstrations. The Salt March and the Civil Disobedience Movement Mahatma Gandhi found in salt a powerful symbol that could unite the nation. On 31st January 1930, he sent a letter to Viceroy Irwin stating 11 demands. Some of these were of general interest, others were specific demands of different classes, from industrialists to peasants. The tax on salt and the government monopoly over its production, Mahatma Gandhi declared, revealed the most oppressive phase of British rule. Mahatma Gandhi's letter was, in a way, an ultimatum. If the demands were not fulfilled by 11th March, the letter stated the Congress would launch a civil disobedience campaign. Irwin was unwilling to negotiate. So Mahatma Gandhi started his famous salt march accompanied by 78 of his trusted volunteers. The march was over 240 miles from Gandhiji's ashram in Sabarmati to Gujarat, coastal town of Dandi. The volunteers walked for 24 days, about 10 miles a day. When Abdul Ghafar Khan a devout disciple of Mahatma Gandhi was arrested in April 1930. Angry crowds demonstrated in the streets of Peshawar, facing armoured carts and police firing. Many were killed. In such a situation, Mahatma Gandhi once again decided to call off the movement and entered into a pact with Irwin on 5th March 1931. By this Gandhi Irwin pact, Gandhiji consented to participate in a round table conference. The Congress had boycotted the first round table conference in London and the government agreed to release the political prisoners. In December 1931, Gandhiji went to London for the conference, but the negotiations broke down and he returned disappointed. To organize business interest, they formed the Indian Industrial and Commercial Congress in 1920 and the Federation of the Indian Chamber of the Commerce and Industries 
FICCI in 1927. Another important feature of the civil disobedience movement was the large-scale participation of women. During Gandhiji's salt march, thousands of women came out their homes to listen to him. They participated in protest marches, manufactured salt, and picketed foreign clothes and liquor shops. Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, who organized the Dalits into the Depressed Classes Association in 1930, clashed with Mahatma Gandhi at the Second Round Table Conference by demanding separate electorates for Dalits. When the British government considered Ambedkar's demand, Gandhiji began a fast unto death. He believed that separate electorates for Dalits would slow down the process of their integration into society. Ambedkar ultimately accepted Gandhiji's position and the result was the Pune Pact of September 1932. After the decline of the non-cooperation Khilafat movement, a large section of Muslims felt alienated from the Congress. From the mid-1920s, the Congress came to be more visibly associated with openly Hindu religious nationalist groups like the Hindu Mahasabha. Muhammad Ali Jinnah, one of the leaders of the Muslim League, was willing to give up the demand for separate electorates. If Muslims were assured reserved seats in the Central Assembly and representation in proportion to population in the Muslim-dominated provinces, Bengal and Punjab. When the civil disobedience movements started, there was thus an atmosphere of suspicious and distrust between communities. Alienated from the Congress, large section of Muslims could not respond to the call for a united struggle. Nationalism spreads when people begin to believe that they are all part of the same nation, when they discover some unity that binds them together. The united struggles for independence helped in building the sense of collective belonging. The identity of the nation is most often symbolized in a figure or image with which people can identify the nation. The image of Bharat Mata was the pictorial representation of the motherland, one day Mataram. The national song was written by Bankim Chandra Chattopadhyaya in 1870s. The national flag which we see today has evolved through various stages. A tricolor, red, green and yellow, was used during the Swadeshi moment. There were eight lotuses on it, which depicted the eight provinces of British India. There was a crescent moon and sun on the flag, which represented Hindus and Muslims. Gandhiji has designed the Swaraj flag by 1921. It was also a tricolor, red, green and white, and there was a spinning wheel in the center. These nationalist histories urged the readers to take pride in India's great achievements in the past and struggle to change the miserable conditions of life under British rule. Conclusion a growing anger against the colonial government was thus bringing together various groups and classes of Indians into a common struggle for freedom in the first half of the 20th century. The leadership of Mahatma Gandhi tried to channel people's grievances into organized movements for independence. The Congress continuously attempted to resolve differences and ensure that the demands of one group did not alienate another. The high points of Congress, activity and nationalist unity were followed by phases of disunity and inner conflict between groups. The British saw Indians as backward and primitive, incapable of governing themselves. In response, Indians began looking into the past to discover India's great achievements.